Sister Patricia, welcome to Just Politics. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Can we start by just having you tell us a little bit about yourself, about your your childhood? We read that your mother was an advocate for racial justice in your community growing up and that you personally integrated a high school. I'm wondering how these early experiences formed you. Uh, the formation came earlier than the integration of Northside High School. Uh, my mother enrolled us in CORE, which is the Congress of Racial Equality. This organization was inspired by Mahatma Gandhi uh, with nonviolent and civil disobedient strategies. I think CORE launched one of the most famous, I think, uh, movements in the civil rights movement. And I think people will remember the famous lunch counter sit-ins that was done by CORE. I was 12 uh, years old when I joined CORE and my siblings were already uh, members. At 12, I was outside our neighborhood Piggly Wiggly grocery store in a picket line to protest the cooperate the corporations. They refused to hire uh, Blacks in, the, in this uh, grocery store, although most of the Piggly Wigglies were located in Black neighborhoods. Uh, the girls in my family were members of the Black Women's Federated Clubs. Uh, and there were from anywhere from 35 to about 50 of these clubs in the United States. And this is where girls learned about important Black women. Uh, we also learned about how to uh, be protesters. Uh, they were famous for uh, protesting the lynching of African Americans. And also, I think in the early 1900s, they appealed to President uh, Wilson to stop the riot, the race riots in Chicago. Um, these experiences taught me, I think, three things that I had to uh, be brave to face racism head on, that I could not challenge racism with a criminal or any kind of record, public record. But I think the greatest learning for me was that integration did not make me an equal. Growing up, I knew I had to join the anti-racism fight because I really wanted to continue in my mother's footsteps. I'd like to kind of loop back to something you said and connect it to some of the work that we do at Network, specifically on the grassroots mobilization team. Okay. You talked about opportunities to learn how to protest. Yes. And and on the grassroots mobilization team, we do how to lobby and how to organize. So can you talk a little bit of, more about those trainings? and how important that was to the work that you did then and, and the work that you've continued to do as your ministry? Yes. Well, um, at the age of 12, one of the most important things that we learned was that we would be protected by the adults on the picket line. And I remember very clearly one of the instructions was that all the children in that line needed to hold their picket signs in front of their faces because they didn't want a backlash for us as we got older if somebody wanted to go after those that had been picketing. And I think the uh, most important thing was that, uh, that they said to us was that whatever names that you're being called, that's not who you are. Hmm. So never take it to heart, never respond to it. And so, uh, and, and we knew that we couldn't get angry. And, and that was the hardest part. But um, I was very grateful for those teachings. And I was very grateful for all of those adults that were out there with, mixed in with children that were so supportive of us. Sister Patricia, could you um, share more about how you found your way both into Catholicism, deeper into Catholicism, and more specifically into religious life? Sure, sure. Um, yes, because I, I was raised Episcopalian, and um, I think it didn't dawn on me to um, change 
you know, uh, religions at that point. It was well after I graduated from college and um, I graduated with an education degree. And after practicing, after practice teaching, uh, I hesitated five years because I was questioning my dedication to teaching. And then when I did decide it's time for me to take that plunge, I applied to an all girls Catholic high school visitation. And it was run by the uh, Cincinnati Dominicans in Chicago. I was impressed by the sisters' determination to equip these girls with a great education. And I was uh, very pleased that the principal, a white sister, learned to play gospel music. And they had one of the greatest gospel choirs in the city. The school was predominantly black. There were a few uh, Latina students there. Uh, after the first week or so at visitation, I noticed that the uh, sisters were trying very hard to make it easy for the girls to attend, to want to be there, and then to stay and finish school. So they did away with the uniform that most Catholic schools required. The girls uh, took that freedom to the nine, as they would say. They came to school in uh, house slippers, PJs, hair rollers, you name it. Uh, to me, uh, the sisters ignoring this, this way that they were dressing screamed of low expectations to me. So the, the first thing I did was to uh, start a club called The Making of a Lady. And in Making of Lady, they had to come to school. It was two days a week. They had to come dress, stockings, skirts, uh, everything. So, And if they wanted to be in the style show at the end of the year, they had to get so many stars in order for them to participate. So that kind of turned around the whole dress thing uh, for the girls at that point. But during this time, I started praying that God would send these sisters a black sister. I had never seen a black sister. This was before Whoopi Goldberg. So, but I hope that there was one around somewhere. Three years I prayed this prayer. One day I missed school because I had the flu after calling in to report my illness. I went back to sleep. Sleep came easily. And then I had a full blown nightmare. My oven was on fire and I was doing everything possible uh, to put this fire out, but nothing, nothing, nothing was working. As I put some baking soda on, uh, because that's supposed to put out the fire, a voice said, and it was very clear, the voice was very clear, what about you? I didn't question, I went straight to the phone book found five Patricia Rogerses there, smiled and said to God, you have the wrong number. <laughs> I couldn't go back to sleep. So I decided I'd make a bargain with God. And because I had, had not seen a black nun, I didn't know if the church accepted African-American women or not. So I said, uh, God, I will apply. I will do whatever is asked of me. If they do not accept me, just know I did my part. Well, the rest is history. Here I am as a sister for 40 years. I love it. And I can, can certainly identify with the sense of, of running away from that initial inkling. I'm guessing many of us can uh, yeah. in various ways. And I'm struck by what you said about the this low expectations Thing. And you've spoken about that in other spaces as well. Mm -hmm. And and the power that comes from having high expectations. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you can speak a little bit more about that. Uh, yes, I, I learned er early on in working with students, uh, what we expected from them is what they gave us. And if we didn't expect much of them, then they gave us nothing. I also learned from that making of a ladies uh, club that I started at visitation that they wanted to be challenged and that they wanted to, they wanted to excel. But, you know, if there was nothing pushing them or demanding that they do something, 
Then they chose the low road. And I was very impressed by that, especially at, at visitation, uh, because I started asking more and more of them. It was more than just two days a week that they had to come looking like a lady. Uh, it even went to that they had, if they were going to wear nail polish, a hey, it couldn't be chipped. If they were going to wear stockings, they always had to have a pair of nylons in their purse in case they got a run. So, I mean, and, and these students did these things. So expectations, high expectations of children, usually they will rise to the occasion. I'm also struck by uh, this sense that your initial reaction was you didn't know any Black Catholic sisters, and so you weren't sure that that was even a possible uh, route for you. And I'm wondering personally, but also kind of broader, how that kind of informs the way you think about the need for role models um, and then the importance of being in various spaces. Uh, yes. And I, and I think that visitation, that was one of the reasons of praying for a black sister. <laughs> it, it wasn't just the, uh, the fact that the expectations were low, but in the school, I think there were two of us that were African-American teachers at that time. And uh, they're just, I didn't think that we had enough role models there. And to be able to call them on their stuff as uh, the, the white sisters couldn't do because they, they well, I don't think they had a, a inkling about when, especially let's, let's take the, the dress code for example. You know, those girls, I mean, a couple of them I went to church with and I knew that they had really nice clothes. But the way they came to school was a different, uh, whole different ball game. So I think role models help in most situations where young people are. I would agree with that. I think in my own life and in hearing you talk, it's really about seeing someone who, who you can see yourself as That's and right. to work and to strive towards, towards that. I'm wondering, as we've talked about your ministry of visitation, we also know that you led the Dominican Center in the Amani mm -hmm. neighborhood in Milwaukee, and you recently retired from there. That's correct. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of that same presence in the, the work that you did and the work that that center did? or continues to do as well? Uh, I think the, the big success of being in the Amani neighborhood and at the Dominican Center was knowing uh, that I had to connect with the community that was there. The people who lived there, I knew that they knew more than I did about what was needed. And so it was my practice there to start nothing on our own that we, and, and we constantly had meetings with, with the community. Every first Saturday was the community meeting. And this is where people could come and, and bring up issues about things that they thought should be happening in the community that were not happening. And it became uh, the cry of the other neighborhood organizations to take on the fact that the, the neighbors had to ask and be willing to participate in whatever it is that we were doing because it, it was what they wanted. And, and that was the real success. Uh, I remember when I first came to Dominican Center, there was a community garden and um, my second or third month that was there, I quickly noticed that the community garden really was the Dominican Center's garden because we would go over the, the, the workers at the Dominican Center, we would go over, we would um, plant the seeds, we would do the weeding and the neighbors would be sitting on the porch watching us. And so finally, you know, I, I said to the folks at the Dominican Center, I said, this is not a community garden. You know, uh, we better ask 
if people are really interested in this? Well, at that point, no one was interested in doing a garden. So, and that really was what helped me in saying before anything starts, we, we have to ask the, the residents, what is it that they want? What would they participate in? And um, we got a lot done because of that attitude. So I, I'm always ready to roll up my sleeves and talk to the people who are most involved uh, in the situation to find out where they want to go and how they want to, to lead the, the, that operation or how they want to be led. From your experience, what were some of the, the, the major issues affecting Amani residents and, and, and how did you, you know, come, come to see those? Um, one uh, huge uh, issue in the Amani neighborhood was illegal dumping. We would have uh, people come from all over the city and dump in the alleys of the uh, Amani neighborhood. And what was happening was that then the city, like if it was your property that they decided they were going to dump right in your alley out in front of your property, then the, the city would find those um, residents. And it really became um, a real issue for many of them. So after bringing this to the uh, Saturday meeting a few times, we got the alderman come in and it just so happened there were a couple of places that uh, residents had some dumping behind their houses. And so we were able to walk them to those locations at that time and uh, show them what was happening. So one of the things that the residents decided that they wanted to do, well, the ring doorbells were popular just at that time. And so they started with the ring doorbells and we helped purchase and have them installed. And uh, we had those same stop, stopped happening in the Amani neighborhood. So, you know, this is just one little example of some of those things. But um, I think another big, problem for them was um, transportation and the lack of a uh, neighborhood grocery store. Those were two things that we worked on for a long time, but were not able to get a grocery store in that neighborhood. But we were able to clean up three of the corner stores that made it possible for them to have uh, more fruits and vegetables and uh, those kinds of things. So there was some movement there as well. I love that. And I love the, the sense of the people who are impacted by the challenges have the solutions. That's right. They know what the solutions are. Um, and so your real exercise in, in subsidiarity and solidarity, uh, those things go hand in hand. And so you're able to start solving those problems with the community Right. Um, because you brought all of your resources together with all of the resources that the community already had. Yeah, and I think one, one of the big things, too, was that they formed their own uh, organization, Amani United. And to see those leaders really, I mean, just take the bull by the horn, they now know who to go to. They knew to call their older person. They knew to to call their senator. They, they knew who to contact in order to get things done. The other thing was that we had the leaders meet at the table with the Dominican Center with any of our funders so that, you know, if the Dominican Center closed, we wanted our funders to know that we had some people in the neighborhood that really were capable of leading their neighborhood. And we had a couple of uh, uh, funders to fund uh, a couple of, let's say, things that people wanted to to have done. And, and one of them was uh, to start a, uh, a garden with the young people 
in the neighborhood. So that that was interesting. So anyway, that those are just you know a few things that were important to me to get done. Yeah, and I think about all of this in the framework of the policies and the systems that have systematically stripped wealth from communities. And so you had to bring in these funders from outside of the community. But it's mm-hmm. not because the people in the community were unable of do, to do these things. It's precisely because U.S. policies have stripped resources mm-hmm. from black and brown communities, mm-hmm. right? That's correct. Absolutely. In an article that we read that was written about you, we read about your mantra about being with the people and not over the people, which you've talked a lot about, and that it's not just a chair at the table, but it has to be a voice and a vote. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little more about that and how it's really how it's guided your ministry, but also how that can guide the work, the good work that all the people listening to this podcast mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and use it as a piece of advice for them. Although there, you know, the, the uh, black and brown communities, it, it seems as if no money comes into those areas, but that's not true. And, and when it does come into those areas, uh, the folks who are responsible for it, and let's say some of the older people, they make the decisions. So it was very important that before those decisions were made, that they had a chance to talk with the people in the community. And it wasn't just to come and tell them what they were going to do, but it was also for them to ask what was needed, and then to listen to the response. So it, there was never a time that I met with the aldermen or even funders without resident leaders at the table with me because I wanted them to know the conversation, know who to contact, uh, and, and to uh, speak up if things weren't going the way that they should. And so that just became a part of the regular routine. No matter where I went, I I didn't ask for any money without talking to the leaders about what that, how that money would be used and the best thing that they saw to do with the money that we were asking for at the Dominican Center. And, And this was all about education and having the leaders be connected to the people who had more power than they did. It sounds like it's also all about being in relationship with mm-hmm. one another and listening and learning from one another. Mm-hmm. Too. Mm-hmm. And, and for them to be known among the, the uh, people with power in the, in the city. Exactly. I'm wondering if we can switch gears a little again and talk um, some about the or racism in the Catholic Church, and specifically, in your opinion, how is what Catholic social teaching says about racism different from your experience of racism in the church or what you see in the church today? Uh, I thought that was a good question. The Catholic Church teaches that all human life is sacred and that the dignity of the human person is kind of the foundation of uh, social teachings. And so if that's true, if there is some dignity in all people, then you have to ask the question, there were black Catholics in the early 1800s. Why was it that their dignity was reduced to them sitting in the rafters of the church or in the basement during mass? And why is it that their children and all black Catholic children were denied a Catholic education before the civil rights movement. And then we look at, you know, even my whole thing about, I I never saw a black nun. And then I learned that the first black nuns uh, had to establish their own congregations because they were not welcome. And it still makes me wonder what happened to the dignity of all humans. And so, you know, you just don't know 
what to do with that sometimes. Uh, the church has written two pastoral letters on the sin of racism, but we still continue to see that there is a lack of, well, we, we see it in the selection of deacons. Uh, we see racism in the non-recruitment of people of color to religious life. And, and we see it in the pews. I think over the years, the Catholic Church has tried to clean up some of these things. But the overtness, I think, of racism in the Catholic Church no longer exists. But through those last three things that I just talked about, it's still there. It, it's, it's still present. And I, I love that you bring up the idea of having to look back in history to find examples of, you know, early communities of Black sisters. And um, I'm curious as to what, what you believe the importance is of knowing our history when it comes to understanding and being able to combat racism, even in the present day and in the future. Yeah, I, I think, well, let's start with the, uh, let's start with the definition of racism. And the definition of racism for me is prejudice plus the misuse of power. And I thought about the whole thing of why was it that people feared African-American men? And that answer just came to me a couple of years ago. And now remembering what the definition of racism is, when I found out, and because this was never taught to me in history, I found out that during Reconstruction, we had 60 plus African American men, college educated, who were uh, in public office, both locally and nationally. What does that equal? That equals a lot of power. And, and that's the real fear. That was a real fear in the beginning for African American men, that their power of the office could make decisions for people who are more than just African-American people. And I st this still is not taught in schools today. I, I'm sure that there wouldn't be a handful of students, African-Americans or even adults, that would know that. Uh, to, the, to the point that we thought that Hiram Revels, I think is his last name, was the first elected to the U.S. Senate. And that wasn't true. So without us really, and especially Black children and African-American boys, if we can't see ourselves in these positions, then we never will uh, even think about the possibility of, of them for ourselves. Just in our congregation, we had some women that asked for the for the habit. The sisters haven't worn the habit for oh a number of years now, and uh, one of these uh, young women that asked for the habit is from Trinidad. And and the thing that I let people know about her asking for the habit is that what an honor it is for the children in Trinidad to be able to see themselves as a sister. And the fact that not many women of color are readily known or suspected to be a sister just because we dress simply, don't wear makeup, we have a cross around our necks, they're not going to automatically think that we're a sister. And uh, a, a case in point was uh, after being at the Dominican Center for six years, Every year we did the automatic walk through the neighborhood. This is where we would walk with the alderman and point out things that needed to happen, like how many uh, boarded up houses we had on one block or whatever it was that we wanted to point out. As we were talking, uh, a neighbor was passing on the other side of the street. And so she started waving at me and she was saying, sister, sister, you and the other sisters, please, pray for my sister. She's seriously ill. And so I said, yeah, I, I will do that. I will definitely, sisters and I will pray. 
So the alderman that was walking with me looked at me and he said, is that why they call you sister? You mean you are a sister? This is the black power symbol, sister? So it, that was just very interesting to me that all these years that you know, he had been talking with me, he had been with me at the Dominican Center, that he did not realize that I was uh, a, a nun and how important it is for that young woman going back to Trinidad to be able to wear the habit and have other Trinidadian and I think Tobago is the other connecting island with them to know that they can, they too could become a sister, just the importance of that. And that's so interesting when I hear you say that, because it, it reminds me almost in a way, well, of what you said earlier about high expectations mm -hmm. and it almost connects to my mind, the idea of like when Michelle Obama talks about mm -hmm. feeling like you have to be twice as good to get half as far and that, um, the feeling that we have to do more just to, because there are systems that are set up that require us to put in more That's correct. to get not as much. Right. When I think about, about voting as one of those systems, um, one of the conversations going on in the elections right now uh, in Georgia in particular is this question of I mean, voter suppression is everywhere. But I'm thinking in Georgia in particular because the candidates have been talking about it and and Stacey Abrams has been very clear that if you're erecting barriers and people are still voting in high high numbers, that's not a great sign for the barriers. It's just that people are so willing to do the work to get around those barriers. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that those barriers don't still need to be taken down. That's right. Right. And so I think about like the, the work that that needs to be done on our democracy, um, the space that we're in in this moment um, about your comment about it has to be not just a chair at the table, but a voice and a vote um, and the history that we're coming from. Um, so I'm wondering, given kind of all of those sorts of things, the history of Jim Crow and Christian nationalism uh, that's been running through our country, where do you see us right now with this threat to uh, to our democracy and to equity in our in our nation? Where I see uh, the United States today, well, it's in the slogan that we hear so often, which is, uh, let's make America great again. That's where I see the United States. For some reason, a number of people are thinking that the past was a lot greater than today. And we know that the past really wasn't in the, the favor of people of color. So what we're seeing today in every city that is 39 plus percent of African Americans, we see that these cities have redrawn their political districts so that African Americans and Latinos have lost one district in those cities, which means decreasing their representation, the African American and the Latina uh, representation with voice and vote. It decreases the political power for the communities of color. So, you know, it, it, it can happen in so many ways. And again, looking at the definition of racism, prejudice plus misuse of power, it it's just continues. And it just, I guess, every hundred years or so, we see it in a different way. As we bump up towards the end of our over time, I'm, I'm curious if you have any words of um, wisdom or places where you find hope that uh, or encouragement that, that you can have to share with our listeners. Sure. Uh, I, I think one of the real hopes and the, uh, of, let's say, religious of color is the fact that we can lean on each other. And the greatest thing that ever happened uh, to me was being a member of the National Black Sisters Conference. This is a place where we can be Black and Catholic. This is a place where we can be, let's say, grounded in the music, the, the talk, the, the walk, whatever you want to say that really uh, 
helps us go back to our white communities. It's not all the time that we can be ourselves in our communities. There are some times when we have to be a different person. So uh, I think the, the thing that I would leave with you is that I hope that we continue to push back on the kind of education about uh, African-American history really will be taught so that our children will know of their own greatness. So that's, that's my prayer these days, and I just ask you to join me in it. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Sister Patricia, for being with us today. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank you.